On the ninth day of Jay's Miss, I reviewed hallucinating people. Eternal Darkness. I only played Eternal Darkness briefly before when I was younger. I thought it was a pretty cool horror game at the time with some interesting gimmicks, but I got lost after only a chapter or two and never picked the game up again, until now. I've heard a lot of good things about this game over the years. It has a pretty big cult following, so it's about time I see what I've been missing out on. Eternal Darkness has an interesting narrative that's told in a really unique way. You play as Alex, who is investigating the mansion of her recently murdered grandfather to find clues about what happened to him. She soon stumbles upon a book that houses a dark history of events, and it's in these pages that the bulk of the game takes place. You go from decade to decade, person to person, reliving the tragic events of these characters as they try their best to stop a dark god from being resurrected. Okay, so right off the bat, this game has an amazing gimmick. How it works is you have a sanity meter that can deplete over time as scary things happen. And if your sanity meter gets low enough, you'll start to hallucinate in various ways, many of which include breaking the fourth wall to the player behind the controller. Sometimes you'll be playing and simply hallucinate that there's a bunch of ammo on the floor or that an enemy has been made tiny. But other times, the hallucinations get much more visceral, such as the game claiming that your data has been erased or that the video connection has suddenly been lost. I think my favorite of all has to be when you're tricked into thinking that the game's ended and you need to wait for the sequel to come out to continue the story. I love stuff like this. Now the game doesn't actually use tank controls, but somehow the gameplay does feel a bit sluggish and clunky all the same. You can run, but have a stamina meter which leaves you very vulnerable when drained. When attacking, you're given an option to aim for the various limbs or head of the enemies in a rigid grid selection sort of way. Depending on which character you're playing as, you'll be using a slew of different weapons, from melee to guns. You'll also be able to use this cursed tome to use magic spells. These can do anything from heal you, create a shield, break magic barriers, or even create an AoE attack. The way you create these spells can be a bit confusing as the menu isn't the most intuitive, and you even have to set shortcuts to the spells manually, which I found weird. Shouldn't new spells just be saved automatically once you've created them? That being said, I do find the crafting mechanic interesting, combining the runes you find in such a way to create the desired effect. For instance, summon plus creature summons, well, a creature. A different one depending on the amount of power you put into it. Most of these spells can be found in game via these recipes, but you can actually try to guess spells ahead of time to find them secretly. Using the spells is kind of weird though. Once you initiate a spell, your magic is used, and then you have to stay still while it activates. If you move even an inch before it's finished, the spell will not trigger, wasting your magic. I wish they had just locked your character in place while this was happening because there were so many times that I moved by accident, botching the spell. I get that they probably wanted to give you the option to abandon a spell and run from enemies, but I'd rather have just committed and get locked into place to be honest. The chapters in this game felt like kind of a mixed bag for me. Sometimes they were fun to get through, other times not so much. It's easy to get lost or stuck on what you're supposed to do next because the game isn't always clear about things. One time I was playing as this architect who's supposed to be examining the various rooms in this underground area. When I had gotten to the final room, I didn't understand what I was doing wrong as it wasn't giving me the prompt. But as it turned out, I needed to be in this very specific spot on this bridge for the option to appear. When I casted the spell and suddenly the blue effigy became visible, I went to that room with the key and a, a randomly a bridge was built for no reason and I was able to grab the key. And that's how we got to this place. Wait, what is this? Oh my god. We had to go to the middle, to this specific part of the bridge to survey the area. Roberto has completed his survey, now he can return to the surface. Right, okay. So that's what we missed, guys. One little tiny piece of the room in the middle of the bridge, which you're probably gonna be running past because there was enemies on the same bridge. Another time I was wondering why a magic barrier hadn't disappeared after I thought I had solved the puzzle. So I ran all over this pyramid thing trying to figure out what else I had to do. I eventually came to find that I just had to walk a bit closer to the barrier to trigger it into vanishing, even though that wasn't something that usually happened. 
The game has the usual ups and downs you'd find in an older survival horror title, but there were a couple moments that actually drove me a bit crazy. For one, the game doesn't have any autosave. This is okay, especially since you're allowed to save whenever you want, so long as there aren't any enemies nearby. That is until I came across this glitch in a specific chapter where for some reason the game suddenly wouldn't let me save at all, no matter if I was in a safe room or not. It persisted for the entire chapter too, but luckily went away after I completed it. But you want to know what really made me lose it? This boss. This freaking boss. I don't even know where to begin. It doesn't seem that crazy at first. He summons attacks, you dodge, he summons zombies, you kill them, and then use a spell to attack the boss when he's flashing and vulnerable. Except it's not that simple. Fact is, if you waste time taking the zombies out and then try to use your spell, chances are the boss isn't going to be vulnerable anymore by the time it reaches him. The window to attack it is very tiny. So just use the spell first, right? That doesn't work either, because if the zombies see you while you're performing the spell, and they will, then you'll take sanity damage and your spell gets interrupted. Uh, okay, well, how about we try going behind the boss then? That way the zombies won't see us and we'll be free to attack. Sure, we could try that. Oh look, the boss has decided to never start flashing since we're behind him now. Why? Why? I don't know why. The only reason I was able to get through this boss is because of help from my chat while I was streaming. They suggested a combination of spells that I wouldn't have known to use. Apparently you can create a shield that will block the zombie stairs, letting you use magic against the boss without being interrupted. This did help, but even then the timings for everything still felt extremely strict and I still had a lot of trouble. I think I spent about an hour on this boss alone and it was easily the hardest part of the game for me. Want to know the real kicker? This was the same chapter that the no saving glitch happened. I was luckily simulating the game on Dolphin and thus was able to use save states to get around it, but lord imagine if I didn't have them. Anyway, I don't want to focus too much on those bad moments. While a bit rough in parts, it had an interesting story and I thought it was a really cool idea for a game overall. I'd love to see a modern day developer take a crack at this same concept. Imagine the potential for all the meta hallucinations with today's technology. On the ninth day of Jay's Messiah. Okay. Um.